Okay, uh, next speaker is uh, Rick Wagner, Sustainability Manager for Chevron Phillips Chemical Company. Uh, Rick has more than 25 years of experience in the petrochemical industry with Chevron Phillips, and uh, he has uh, previously worked in polyethylene sales, application development, and product development, and as a refinery chemist. So uh, he also serves as the team leader for the Plastics Energy Recovery Team and a member of the Value Chain Outreach Committee, the, the Plastics Packaging Team, and Flexible Films Recycling Group of the American Chemistry Council. And last but not least, also represents the World Plastics Council and the Trash Free Seas Alliance. And Rick is here wearing, in part, his World Plastics uh, Council hat, and we also appreciate uh, WPC's sponsorship of this event. So please, without further ado, are you wired up? Uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm on. So uh, first thing that I'd like to do is thank uh, Doug uh, for his leadership and vision on putting on these plasticity events, um, continuing to press the envelope. And that's one of the reasons why the World Plastics Council is a sponsor, and we continue to do that. And I really appreciate all of you who are here as uh, coming to listen to us, as well as being speakers, investing your time towards designing better outcomes in the future. So is there a... Thank you very much. Huh, big green button. I guess this is the easy button. So uh, the World Plastics Council uh, came about, uh, it was announced in 2013, and uh, we had uh, a number of global plastics and large regional plastic companies saying there are a lot of big issues that a single company can address. And we're looking for a way to come together and uh, have some ambitious outcomes towards sustainability, towards um, addressing global issues, and getting feedback from a diversity of regional players to address local, have actual local outcomes. Because as uh, we are hearing from our colleague here from Australia, uh, you know, there are certain specific issues in countries and regions that are going to be different that, than what's happening in Europe, what's happening in South America or the U.S. You know, it, and it really, um, we needed a forum to share these best practices and to learn where did these things work where did they go wrong, and how do we improve our success? And that's where the WPC came out. Um, and you know, when you look at what our, our goal is, our ambition is plastic sustainability. And you know, our main focus, our, our first issue to address has been marine debris. And the way that we have been starting to work through this was to look at, well, how can we communicate best practices in recycling uh, and reuse? Um, how can we reduce, you know, help, help each other reduce and be more efficient in providing materials in, in, in the first place? As well as if there are difficult to recycle materials, um, how can you divert these things from the landfill? Are there other technologies uh, for energy recovery or chemical recycling? But the key thing is, it's all kind of addressing how does that roll back into marine debris? And you know, this is where we put a lot of our focus into. Uh, we became members of the Trash Free Seals Alliance um, in 2016. And that's, that's where I'm a representative of. And we, we've got a lot of good movement towards defining what the problem is and trying to find a way how can we address the reduction of marine debris. Getting, uh, how can we reduce 
plastics from getting into the ocean in the first place. And the goal of the Trash Free Seas Alliance is a 50% reduction in plastic getting into the ocean by 2025, and we think we can do that. So, you know, we, we've got, like I said, a diverse group of members. You, know, you look at these players, and uh, they're from all over the world. Some of them are regional players, some of them are global players. Um, but the key thing is we all bring something, some value to the, the game. And each of us, we all have our own specific programs, things that we're trying to reduce uh, raw material usage demands by improving product performance so that you can down gauge Material, a good example, you know, uh, one ubiquitous use of polyethylene is milk bottles. How many see milk bottles at their store um, in plastic? A lot, you know, a lot. Well, over the last 20 years, the amount of polyethylene that's been used to make that milk, milk jug, reduction, 20%. And that's all through the improvement of materials and the improvement of design and construction of those bottles. So, you know, that, that reduction er effort that uh, all of our members and, and related associations is valuable to this, this cause. Um, also, product use and reuse. Um, in the durables world, like for instance in Australia, making cisterns out of out of polyethylene. You want those things to last as long as possible. You don't want to be replacing them every 20 years. You want them 30, 40 years. Or plastic uh, pipe that might have 50 to 100 year lifespans. Um, those are kinds of things that if you're able to extend their life for the right kind of applications where you really want them to extend their life, that reduces the footprint uh, in, in the world. As well as recycling, there's been a lot of talk about design for recycling here. And, you know, it's, it's uh, can you come up with better designs? Can you work as a coalition to develop practices that might improve uh, uh, infrastructure to collect plastic, to reduce the cost into converting recycled plastic into actual goods to increase the demand. So increase the demand for the recycled product content. Because if you think about it, if um, you increase the amount of recycled material, but the demand stays flat, the value of that material is gonna go down, 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 and the market will collapse. So you have to do everything uh, you know, do, do your homework not only in making things more recyclable, but you also have to prop up, find better ways to use that recycled material um, in different end uses. And then the other thing is um, develop other better end of life scenarios. So when you look at the life cycle of plastic and if you're saying, gee, I want to uh, reduce the footprint of a package, and the ultimate reduction is, ends up being a flexible package that's multi-layer, and that's the, the most efficient thing. There are better ends of life than just sticking in the landfill. There's things like chemical recycling, uh, pyrolysis, plastics to energy, that for the right places, um, after you've recovered everything that could be recycled, that you divert that from landfill. So, you know, the, the key thing is all of our members and plastics associations are all not only together trying to do something, but we're all trying to find better ways and uses and throughout the life cycle of our products that, that product stewardship value. Now, I know... There hasn't been a lot of talk here about marine debris, but here's what I'm gonna tell you. 
uh, there's a lot of good thoughts about better design. I hear a lot of good technology and, and uh, a lot of uh, thoughts about how can we divert these things and, and make better use of, of uh, uh, circular economic forces. And, you know, what I want to say, I want to challenge the folks here in this room. I want to challenge you to think about this. How can you make the design of your plastic products or the designs of your packages or your plastic materials to reduce the risk of those materials to leak into the ocean? So that means if you're making what might be a cup, do you have a plastic lid that might be attached to that cup or a straw? Is there a better way to design the straw? Or do you design the lid differently? Or do you design the cup differently to include some kind of straw-like mechanism? I'm not saying that that's the ultimate solution, but the key thing here is we've got a lot of smart people. We just have to think a little bit differently. How can we take um, our design experience and come up with better solutions. And, you know, I, I, looking at a different industry, I'll, I'll take that up of looking at Dyson. Okay, Dyson upended the whole market for vacuums and actually just anything that's air-related. And they, they took a vacuum motor and reduced it by 30%. But you know what? They've continued to reduce that motor Tremendously, and now the motor today, I think, is something 30% of the size of that original 30% uh, reduction. That's an extraordinary change that was all made through design. So I challenge you guys, think about that. Because those design things that you're looking at for the circular economy, that also helps towards marine debris reduction. So that's the message that I want to leave to you today, and I'll take any questions if you have any. Anyone with a question for Rick? WPC has been doing a lot of great work in this space, uh, but also. Um, I think this is an interesting dynamic, but the, the Western world typically, Rick, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Europe and U.S. had been the real drivers for these kind of global associations, and they've been also the ones who put in the money to try to drive new programs. And they've been, since doing outreach, really trying to get other parts of the world, Southeast Asia, Middle East, um, other players in the industry to be part of the WPC and also play their role as an engaged uh, corporate um, entity in those communities. So I think it's really good to see what WPC is doing in this space and very collaborative in all of their work. So, yeah, Matt, or Libby, quick one, then Matt. Doug. Rick, I'm curious how your organization is collaborating with municipalities in the United States. It's just such a fragmented, waste management uh, patchwork. How do you even begin to think about working with that? So um, I would put it in a lot of what the WPC does. You know, right now we're focused primarily on marine debris. And I would say that in the US, probably the closest connection to that would be like the closed loop fund. And, and that's a, a way to get those kinds of local things happening on a national scale. Uh, because you're right, it's a, it's a patchwork. Now, I'd be happy to talk to you. I can put my other hats on, ACC or CP Chem, and talk about all the other things that I'm involved in that are addressing some local issues. But from the WPC thing, it's primarily the, um, the, the closed loop fund 
and, and other groups that are looking at the bigger picture and identifying, hey, where are the real big problems? And in reality, uh, the, the science says that the issue is primarily coming from Asia. You know, if you look at, there's five countries that are making approximately uh, 50% of the marine debris. Um, and, and if you think about that, and if you look at the top 10, even the top 10, they're mostly in Asia as well. So uh, the key thing is that's a, a place where infrastructure uh, solutions are at a premium uh, uh, focus. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks, Rick. Great presentation. Um, I So yesterday, and uh, Rick and I have been participating in Earth Day Texas, another uh, discussion happening here. And yesterday, you mentioned that um, plastics industry was, was looking at specific strategies to help solve plastic pollution, including things like leashing the lid of a, of a bottle cap to a bottle. And the, the question that you asked to the audience about how can you make design of plastic materials to reduce risk of plastics leaking to the ocean? I mean, that's really a, that's a game changer right there, what you talked about. And the reason why I wanted to bring it up is because um, just last week in California, we're working on a bill, a, a leash the lid legislation in California, and Coca-Cola came up and said the technology is not there. And so I'm just curious, what kinds of conversations is the plastics industry having about those kinds of, of kind of game-changing design technologies to, to change uh, the situation on plastic pollution. Thank you. Yeah, so um, as a person who's been in application development over the years, uh, what I'll say is, um, although it sounds like a simple solution, hey, why don't you just attach it? Unfortunately, the, the way to actually get to that is not necessarily a simple thing to do. So what I do know is that there are a lot of very smart people at converting companies and um, at plastic companies who are working on this, using CAD designs and material designs to try and find how can you actually make this come to fruition. And it, it unfortunately, I, all I can say, it's gonna take time, it's gonna take sweat equity towards making it happen. So that's why I, I'm out here saying, I, I want more people involved because the more you get involved, the closer you're likely to come with a, a marketable solution. Does that answer your question? Great, you, you, you wanna read? Another question, Rick, just about the, you know, the, I mean, and we've already heard it today from other speakers, the, the abysmal recycling rates around, around plastics in the U.S. and around the world. You know, what has the plastics industry uh, talked about or discussing internally on, on ways to improve that and provide the investment that we need to help in increase the recycling of plastics? Thanks. So, um, oftentimes that's a local situation. Um, what I can talk to is most of my experience is in North America, but I also have somewhat of a, a look into the European model. And you say, well, the European model is often held up as a model that, gee, there are 80 to 95% diversion from landfill, right? That's, and they're proud of that. Note the key difference of, of wording. I said diversion from landfill. Uh, if you look at the raw data for what's happening in Europe, 30 to 40% of plastic materials are being recycled. And then the rest, that's chemical recycling, energy recovery type uh, recovery. So, you know, there are, even, even where you've got uh, societies where it's a highly focused area, um, there's a limit to infrastructure and the ability to actually recycle everything 100%. So the, the, you know, the key thing here is for here in the US, 
develop the in infrastructure and end markets uh, uh, to have the demand for recycled products because the more the end market's there, I will, I will guarantee you if there's an end market call for it, there's going to be more recycling happening. Right now, there's not. So we need to find more end markets. We need to find ways to drive out the cost of collection and be more efficient. Things like using IoT and, and big data to have efficient collection systems. And there are a lot of startups right now who are looking at this right now. That lowers the cost, lowers the greenhouse gas footprint of collecting um, recycled materials. You start doing that, that then again incentivizes uh, the value of those recycled materials. Great. Thank you very much, Rick. We Thanks. appreciate it and appreciate your uh, support for plasticity.